Amen. Turn to someone before you're seated and just tell them he is a really good God. He is a, he is a really good God. He is a really good God in our life. The goodness of God is amazing. So we stop and we take time to reflect on what he has done in our selfishness, our arrogance, and our greed. We oftentimes are just wanting God to do more. And we don't pause to look and see what he has done. And when to take that time, we look around us in our, again, our, our greed, and we think, well, somebody's got more than me, and so we're not happy until we've got more than someone else along the way, instead of stopping and being thankful for what the Lord has done and what we do have in our life. It was, uh, I want to say, say thank you to the men that took the time yesterday morning to come and to be here with, for men's breakfast, those that got here early and helped prepare it, and uh, those that, that took the time to be here. Um, it is a, a, v- a valuable part of just growing together in our relationship and fellowship with one another. Um, and I say this probably monthly afterwards. Uh, we always make the announcement beforehand, but we say it afterwards just because I want you to know I, I value this. It's not just um, guys getting together and drinking some coffee, but we do share our lives together. It is a meaningful part of just getting to know each other. It brings strength and health to our church. Um, I want to say thanks for, for Paul, uh, one of our uh, elders here, um, shared yesterday morning just again on God's faithfulness and to be able to, to be vulnerable, to be open. Um, some of the doubts that he struggled with and, the, and, and yet how God's faithfulness has brought him through. And so it's just an incredible time for us men to get together and to be able to, to share life uh, as we go forward. So I want to say thank you for those that were there. We have started this year of saying instead of just having a verse of the year, that we're having a different emphasis every month. And sometimes the verse will plug directly into the message and sometimes it's just good for us to, to learn the word, amen, and meditate on it and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. And this, this uh, month coming, and so I'm just going to kind of uh, uh, just bring it to your attention today as we're wrapping up this month pretty quickly here. The month coming here, it's going to be John 2022, 20, and so it's going to be something that you're going to want to get stirred up on the inside of you as we're... Uh, looking at uh, Easter will be coming quickly here, the resurrection, um, the life of, our, of Christ as we put a, an emphasis in this month to come, the Sundays to come here on his last week and uh, last days and his example for us. But John 20, 22, when Jesus, this is actually after the resurrection, of course, that he comes and it just fits so good into the song that we just sang. But it, Jesus is at, at the, after the resurrection, of course, they're standing there looking at him. He is the resurrected Christ, according to Romans, it tells us how does someone become born again if they believe and confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? They're saved, they understand that. And the disciples, of course, are having this experience. And when he, Jesus, had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive you the Holy Spirit or receive you the Holy Ghost, depending on which translation you have. That believing is never enough. There always has to be a receiving that goes along with it. It's not just educating people. There's always an element of surrender, uh, always an element of willingness to surrender to the Lord's will in our life. And this verse, even though Jesus was the resurrected Lord and even though he had defeated death, hell, and the grave, his mission or his whole purpose really wasn't, wasn't completed until people would receive the Holy Spirit in their life individually. And of course, this jumps us right back into the very beginning when God created Adam and Eve and he created man from the dust of the earth and he formed man. And yet, man was really no different than anything else God had created until he breathed into him the breath of life. That's what made Adam like God. That's what made Adam different than everything else. In the world today, there's a lot being said about everyone is created in the image of God and that we need to treat everyone the same because everyone is created in the image of God. I understand the element that we are all created from the, our, and have come from the descendants of Adam, but there's a difference between being created in the image of God and being recreated with the new spirit on the inside of us and being children of God. Every one of us, Every human has a spirit on the inside. But there's a difference between 
having a spirit and having the spirit of God recreating us on the inside. So there are some differences there as we go forward. And so to this week, uh, and as we go through this month uh, looking forward, really be meditating on this verse. What are you breathing in in your life? What do you, what do you, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. What are you receiving in your life for direction? What are you receiving in your life for strength? What are you receiving into your life? You have that decision to make. No one can force this into you. Jesus wouldn't force the Holy Spirit on anyone. And you can't, the world can't force itself on you when we have the greater one on the inside of us. Amen? So the importance here that we can do really, as we move to our message today, we can do nothing without God in our lives. It's just good for us once in a while just to, to step back and kind of just go to the basics and just remind ourselves, I can do nothing without God. I don't care all the self-helps, you can go get yourself as many life coaches as you want to. But really, if you're going to do anything in life, it's going to take God in your life. And the way we, we, God works with us is that we just receive Him. It's a yieldedness. It's an act of faith. It's not that we deserve him. It's not that we deserve what he wants to do in our lives. It is just because he is God and he steps into our life. And when he steps into our life, that's when the incredible, the amazing can start to take place in our lives. It's not when we've prayed enough, earned enough, studied enough, or quoted enough scriptures. It's just when we realize that when God steps into us, the fullness of God steps into our life and releases the potential releases what he wants to do. And so today, as we're starting to look towards the, the last week and, and days of Jesus, I want to just talk about humility, the path of blessing. We wouldn't think that that would go together, and yet we see it in Jesus' life. And we actually, as we read through one of the translations here in a few moments from John's Gospel, that Jesus uses this terminology the way it's translated, that this is really the path of blessing. A path that is already blessed. A path that as you go down it, there's already provision of blessings that are available for us. Humility is such an important part of our everyday life. And I want you to know, as blessed as we are in this church, and as spiritual as you people are, every single one of us have to deal with pride. Every day of our life, we have to deal with pride. Sometimes it comes in little forms, and sometimes it's maybe more, uh, more, more just, you know, just in your face. Sometimes that pride sneaks up to us. Sometimes it's religious in it. Sometimes the pride comes in the, cell, in the, in the form of false humility along the way. Pride is something that we have to deal with because we all got flesh. And this flesh, this flesh has been tainted, it has been polluted with Satan's sin. And what was the sin that kicked Satan out of heaven? What terrible thing did he do in heaven that removed him? It was the sin of pride. When he ceased to be humble, when he ceased to acknowledge God, when he stopped depending on God, you know what? That an act of pride in our life is simply when we say, God, I got this. Actually, when we sense and look at our life and we see that we are praying less, sometimes that's a symptom of pride in our life because we don't need God. I don't need to pray about it. I don't need to do anything about it. I'm going to work it out. I can handle it. I don't need God's involvement in it. And if we're, not, if we're not careful, we're saying, I can handle this. It's a sense of pride that comes into our lives. And yet we see Jesus God's very son, God in the flesh amongst us, and we see him spending whole nights in prayer. We see him often returning to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would go and spend whole t uh, hours and evenings in prayer with the Father God. Our example of humility. And so today, I want to just refresh ourselves in this. And I don't expect a lot of amens when you're talking about humility. I don't expect a lot of us to say, oh, praise the Lord, I want some more of that. Our flesh struggles with this. Our, fle our flesh doesn't like this. But will you receive the Holy Spirit? Will you receive revelation 
in your life that you understand what it is to be confident in Christ but not prideful in our religion? Will you see what it is to, be, to, to come into the Lord's presence and, and to know that he will accept you and have that humility in your life that you know God is going to love you? I, I was just going over this and just thinking about the difference between the woman at the well who told Jesus, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't even talk to me. Compared to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and when Jesus went into their house, they, they dishonored him. They didn't even wash his feet, which is one of the common day, things of the day. They dishonored him. What is our attitude towards Christ? Our humility. Yeah, we've all messed up. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've, we've all done some terrible things. We've all said, well, pastor, what terrible things have you done? You don't need to know my terrible things. You got your own terrible things, all right? You just, you keep, you keep them to you and I keep mine to me, all right? And sometimes the terrible things aren't, aren't the things that are actually on the outside. It's those things on the inside. You now we got to deal with. You know, the illustration Zach used earlier, the woman that put the two mites in it. <coughs> You know, her humility was there, and yet the, the, that scripture talks about those that would come who would, at that time, they would have actually like a, a, a metal or a copper pot that would be there, that they would put the, the offerings into, the money into, and of course the money at that time was coins, they didn't, you know, didn't have a four square or they didn't have a card they, they would run, they would have to pour the money in or put the money into that pot. The wealthy individuals would come and they would make sure as they would pour their coins into that pot. That it could last as long as possible so people could hear just how much money they were putting into it. And yet there was really no way for her to hide the two coins that she would drop. It's all about pride and humility in our lives. It's not just doing the right thing, it's the right attitude that we have in the thing that we're doing. And it's so important in the body of Christ. In this day and age especially, when Christianity, when the church has become such a, 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 a flamboyant at times expression of humanity instead of a humble expression of Christ's love for humanity. We've got to make a difference. Humility, the path of blessing. Everybody has to deal with it. As I script, read the scripture, you can just write it down. You don't need to look. Obadiah is only one chapter in the Old Testament. If you don't know where it is, it's going to take you a while to find it. So just write down the reference. Obadiah verse 3 says, The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the, the cleft of the rock, in your lofty dwellings, who say in your heart, notice they didn't do anything wrong, they said in their heart, who will bring me down to the ground? This scripture talks about those that had achieved. They'd made it. They were the ones that, that you could look up at their houses and say, wow, what would it be like to live up there? And in their hearts, they had gotten to a point where they, they thought, well, man, I have made enough money. I have built a, a fortress here. There's nothing that can take me down. I don't need God. I am secure in what I have. And, and all of those people down there, I'm sure they look up to where I live. They look at my life. And they wish they were me. The prophet is saying here, you are putting your trust in the wrong thing. And you have deceived by the pride of your heart. Folks, please don't think that I'm a doom and gloomer. Please don't think that I, I'm preaching fear. But everything you got can be gone that fast. Everything you got can be gone just that quick. It only takes one fire for your house to be gone. It only takes one turn in the economy for your job to be gone. It only takes, takes one accident for your health to be gone. It only takes one, one second for everything that you think you can trust in, it, your retirement, whatever it is that you think you have a confidence in, to be gone in your life. I'm not trying to be discouraging here. Just don't let pride deceive you because I want you to know nothing can take God from you in life. And even if you don't got a job, you still got a God. 
Even if you don't have health, you got God. Even if you don't have some of these other things in your life, God's with you. And he said that he can be trusted in to bring us out in our lives. And so we don't trust in the, where we dwell physically, but we trust in the God spiritually who said he will take care of us in our life. As you start to see here, this is the blessed path to be on. Because he said that no one will be able to pluck us out of the hand of God. They might be able to take our job, but I'm not trusting in my job. They might be able to take my house, but I, I'm not trusting in my house. I'm trusting in God in my life. And every day he's there with me. I'm not trusting in popular opinion of what people think about me or, or, my, my, uh, or what my reputation is. I'm trusting in the Lord in my life. Pride always has an element of deception in it. Humility always has the element of reality in it. It has an element of reality. I understand who I am. I understand what God wants to do in my life. And I'm okay with that. There's a reality to it in my life. So as we follow after the example of our Lord Jesus, we understand that, that he knew who he was. He knew what God was going to do in his life. And even when the points went every one. Now, I don't think most of us have probably gotten to the point that everyone has forsaken you. And I don't think most of us have gotten to the point that not only did everyone forsake us, the only ones that were left were the ones that wanted to kill us. And yet Jesus, at that very moment, even when he's hanging on the cross, he has the confidence that the Father is going to take care of him. That's real humility. I can follow after the Father's will and know that regardless of what happens, even when it doesn't look like things are going good, that I know that God can turn all things together for good in, his, in my life when I trust in him. The confidence that we can have in our life is so important. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, if you want to turn there quickly, it's a familiar scripture that we, 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 we quote and yet I want to pause for us for just a few moments and kind of allow this to stir on the inside of us. Again, as I mentioned, I have an incredible sense this morning of my inabilities. I would just assume anybody got up here today other than me. And it's not that to say that there's anything wrong in my life or bad in my life or I didn't study for my message today. It's just there's times in our life where the Lord just, it's not that he, he takes his hand off of us. He just gives us a fresh dose of reality in our life. And the need that we have the dependency that we have or should have on him. That in this day and age as we're going forward, church, we, we have to be more Christ-centered, Christ-missioned, and Christ-surrendered in our life individually. We have to. Statistics show us that church attendance in America has gone down consistently. And it's not because of opposition. It's not, because of the, it's not because they're putting people in jail for being Christians. It's not because we're being persecuted on the streets because we're Christians. It's not because of, of worldly opposition. Here it is. It's because of selfish opportunities. Selfish options that we have. I don't have, hear people saying, I don't go to church because it's dangerous. Because I could lose my job. I hear people go, saying, I don't go to church because, well, I, it's, I just don't enjoy it. It's not my kind of music. I don't like the preacher. They're not nice to me. It, I don't get much out of it. It's inconvenient for me. Sundays are my only day off. Now, in, in, in what we're talking about, don't all of those seem pretty silly to be, to be mild here? That we don't have time for church. And, and, and I hear people say, well, I don't have to go to church to have a relationship with God. I understand that. But God has established a church to do a mission. And we all need to be together to do that mission and accomplish that mission together. It's not just what you get out of it. It's what, what Christ has put in you to put into the church. It's not just what I get out of being here. It's what we put into what God is doing and wants to accomplish in our lives. 
And if we're not careful, we look at selfish opportunities. Where, where could I be on Sunday morning other than in church? Where could I be on Saturday afternoon other than helping at church? Where could I be on Friday night other than helping at the church? Where could I be on Wednesday night other than helping on church? Where could I be on some of these other events? Surely there's things to do, and I'm not saying you've got to be at everything, but Jesus saved your life for a greater purpose than just for you to enjoy life. Nowhere do I see in the scripture that it tells us, that's a microphone, I, I'm not going through change of life or anything here, guys. It's just, it's, uh, nowhere do I see in Scripture that it tells us that following after Christ is always supposed to be entertaining to you. It's always supposed to be fun. It's always supposed to be convenient. And it's always supposed to be comfortable. Now with that, let's read Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Now, I'm a church member. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's the standard. It's just as Zach said earlier, it's not about putting 10% in the plate when it goes by. Are we giving our whole life to God? And I'm not asking, even, even saying, are you giving 10% of your life to God? It's our whole life belongs to God. If Jesus really stepped into my skin, then he is all of my life every day of my life. If I understand the old Dennis was crucified with Christ, my sin, my sin nature, that selfishness, self-centered, self-indulged nature that used to be, when I have given that over to him and Christ comes in and then he is going to sanctify my daily life by him living through me in this life. Humility is where I understand this isn't about me. It is carrying on the work that Jesus has called each one of us to be. Jesus did not just suffer so that we could have an entertaining church, but that he could gain each one of us to be a witness to the lost world that is around us. Humility is where I'm saying, I want to be what in what involved in what God has saved me and put me into. Now, Jesus knew with his disciples in his last day, few days that we're looking here, if you want to turn over to John's Gospel, chapter 13. We're talking about humility, the, the path of blessing. We're talking about our lives, that we must understand that in reality, humility in our life is where we understand what Jesus has done for us, that he now is in us, and now my life belongs to him, and I want to live a life that glorifies him, is a witness to the world around me of what he can do in my life, but also then that I understand that he's going to take care of me all the way through this. Now in John chapter 13, we're going to read in just a few moments of the incredible blessing and value of humility that we need to be refreshed of in our lives. If you will remember, Jesus is preparing his disciples here. He knows what's going to happen. He knows, he knows not only the suffering that he's going to go through, but he also knows the suffering that his followers are going to go through. Now, I'm not here to say that we got to get, you know, in, every one of us have to be stoned, imprisoned, or something terrible happen in our lives. But I am saying that every one of us need to be willing to follow after Christ regardless of the discomfort or suffering that comes into our lives. Remember, some of the early, the, 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 of the 12 disciples, all but one of them, all but one of them was, was, was martyred. One of them that was was filleted while he was alive. One of them crucified upside down. They were, they were martyred, they were made fun of, and yet they gave their life and we're still talking and experiencing what they did today. Their humility said, I understand that my life belongs to God and whatever I must do, I will do. They did not allow themselves to be to be controlled by, by the discomfort, but listen to me, they also were careful about the temptation of being used of God. And that could be a whole nother message. The temptation where you start to be looked at like a holy man of God. The temptation of influence and wealth that comes along sometimes with being blessed of the Lord. Not just preachers, but if we're not careful, we start looking at ourselves as that Obadiah scripture is one of those people up in the cliff looking down at others. We start to think we're better than someone else. 
we're not careful, and, and, and we will never allow it to happen in this church, but it was, it, we, we see it back in James and other places where they had problems that were in the church. People were, were, were evaluated by how they were dressed. People were evaluated by where they came from, and, and they were, were treated differently. And we, we, humility realizes all of us were worthless without forgiveness. No matter how much money you have without Jesus, you're broke. And so there's a sense where we all come in in, in reality into his presence. And the disciples were not only going to be faced with with the opposition of suffering with the sword, but they were also going to be faced with, with the privileges that came along with being the disciples of Jesus. And the great influence that they had as they went forward. That we must always keep our heart right before the Lord and what he wants to do in our lives. I'm saying all this folks because in this day and hour we need to be true witnesses for Christ. We need to be ready for any disagreements or I mean any discomforts that come to our flesh. But we must also be ready that when the Lord starts to use us that we realize it wasn't me. It was Christ in me. And that we are the most humble when it comes to those opportunities of Christ using us in life. John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 1. Jesus knew that on the evening of the Passover day that it would be the, his last night on earth before returning to the Father. During supper, the devil had already suggested to Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that this was the night to carry out his plan to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. And how he loved his disciples. Can you pause for just a few moments and put that little dinky phrase into the scope of what's going on? Jesus knew that tonight is the last night. Jesus knew his death was imminent. Jesus knew what was about all of these things that are starting to crash and to come together. Periodically, I get a chance to travel to another country, and, and, and weeks before I go, I start to collect stuff that I think I'm going to need. And so that I don't wait till just the last night, because if I wait till the last night, I'm, I'm going to forget something along the way. First time I went on a, on a trip overseas to, to, to Spain, I forgot my passport. Not a good thing to forget on the way. So Jesus is here at this last night. He's putting all of these things together, but I think it's, infa- it's it, it, the scripture by no means is an accident that he puts that phrase in there. How he loved his disciples. I want you to know as a disciple of Jesus that whatever you're about ready to face, one of the greatest strengths you can have in your life is to know this. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. One of the most humbling things in my life is when I stop and just think about the fact that God loves me. It's not what I've achieved so far. It's not how many years I've been at this church. It's not how many incredible people come to our congregation. It's, it's not, not the car that I drive. It, 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 it's the fact that God loves me. You can take anything and everything out of my life. Yeah, I, I could turn into a Job sitting on, on a garbage heap with sores. Broke and sick. But if God still loves me. Well, it's incredible how it transforms our life. If we're not careful, even in the church, folks, and and I know you know these things, but if we don't remind ourselves of it, it's easy for us to get upset with God. It's easy for us to get angry at God. We we, we get to a point where we want God to do things for our lives, and if he doesn't do this, we get mad at him. That that sense of arrogance slips into pride, and, and, and we deceive ourselves. And Why do you think God ought to do all that for you? And Well, because I'm better than someone else, or because I deserve it more than someone else. Folks, we don't deserve anything, but God still loves us anyway. And these disciples that were going to go through some incredible suffering and temptations and problems that they were facing. And yet it tells us right here how he loved his disciples. He didn't remove them from the problem. He just said, I'm going to make sure that they're able to go through whatever they face in their life. So he got up. This is how he demonstrated his love. This is what he did. So he got up 
from the supper table and he took his, off his robe and he wrapped a towel around his loins. And he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to then to wipe them with the towel that he had around him. What an incredible example that he gives us of love. Love that is, is connected with this, this sense of humility alone. It, Jesus was not... Was not um, he wasn't uh, uh, lessened in what he did. He didn't feel like he was less of a person because he took this position to wipe the disciples' feet. He was secure in who he was, and because of that, he was willing to serve anyone at any level. If we would take the time, the, the towel that the, the lowest servant would have used, and that was the person who had the job of washing the feet, it would have been the lowest person on the totem pole's job to do that. And they would have taken a, a very menial towel. It would be just a step up from a rag from us. And this towel that he would have gone and, and would have wrapped around himself. I'm not going to wear a skirt today, guys, okay? So I'm just going to hold it out here. But this, this towel, this towel, it wasn't just that it was less of a garment, but this towel would tell everyone else, you're less of a person because you're wearing this. But Jesus was secure in who he was. And so labels didn't change him. Other people's opinions didn't change him. If someone else happened to see him serving the very lowest job with this on him, he was still secure in who he was. That's real humility, folks, when we can serve and we're not afraid who sees us serving. We, where we're willing to, to what other people would call us or label us or look down on us because what we're doing, and we can say with humility on the inside of us, it doesn't change who I am in Christ Jesus along the way. That it's not beneath me to serve anyone, anywhere, at any time along the way. Humility in our life is being like Jesus because I'm doing it out of love. I'm not doing it to try to impress God. I'm not doing it to try to impress you. Now, I know, and maybe you've even been in services before, done it before, you know, where they have a foot washing services. Jesus didn't give us this so we could have foot washing services. Jesus gave us this as an example that if he was willing to humble himself and serve out of love, then we need to be doing the same thing in our lives. So the quick question here is, where are you serving? The quick question here is, when your flesh is tempted to say no because it is beneath me, is that something that we need to check up on in our life? Are we too busy to serve? Are we too important to serve? What excuses do we give ourselves? That's someone else's job to do that. It's very easy for me to be able to, especially being here for 25 years almost in ministry, to be able to say, someone else, it's about time someone else do that. But I intentionally keep my flesh under control. I'm not saying that I do everything because there wouldn't be any reason for somebody else, but I'm willing to do anything. Yesterday when they had the fifth and sixth graders here and they, they were doing the eMERGE group and they had workers downstairs that were given their Saturday afternoon serving those young, you know, those young leaders of the church. You know, I didn't have to be down there doing the Bible study. They were busy doing that. So I went upstairs and did the dishes. I'm sharing that as an example, not for you to say, oh, pastor, isn't that amazing? <laughs> Thanks, Josh, man. <laughs> Appreciate that, buddy. Uh, but see, if we're not careful, we sometimes do things to show people how humble we are. And we become prideful in our humility. And this thing get com it gets complicated really quick, doesn't it? Because it always goes back to the heart. Why am I serving? Why am I not serving? Is there something more important that I want to do? Sometimes we have people say, well, I want to get involved in church, but they won't let me do what I want to do. It's not really serving when we just do what we want to do. 
since Josh was so cute there and clapping, you know, when he was younger, like 16, 17, we'd say, go clean your room. He didn't go do it because he wanted to. Basically, he didn't go do it, but he didn't go do it because he wanted to. It was because of what it needed to be done. In the church, family, folks, we've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. Christ lives in us. And the Christ that is in us gave us this wonderful example of serving. Serving in humility, motivated by love. In a way that, that made, the other, made the disciples in some ways uncomfortable. Because of the, the depth of this experience that he, he showed them. But Jesus gave us the great example. He took the towel. He intentionally served. He seen this as an opportunity. He did it because of what needed to be done. Not because, not because he was trying to just start a new ordinance for the church. Real quickly to, to wrap things up this morning. Jump over to, to Philippians chapter 2. It, it summarizes this for us in, in, a, in, a, in a powerful way. We're not going to have a foot washing service today. We don't have sign ups in the hallway of, of how to get more involved in Grandview. I want you just to simply have a heart of what needs to be done. What do you see as an opportunity that could be taken care of? Sometimes that's you know, helping someone... You know, Marilyn and I have had, had different stories. It's amazing at times. People, maybe someone had fallen down and everybody looks at them and is like, wow, they ought to get up. Maybe you should be the one that goes over and helps the person up. When do we see opportunities that are around us that we could actually be a blessing? That person in the grocery line that has a, that's maybe a couple dollars short that you're able to step in there and help. Well, I don't like some of the groceries they got in their grocery cart. Well, you know what? Uh, that's not really the, the, the thing here. The thing is, how can we serve? How can we help? That's like saying, I want to wash people's feet, but not the dirty ones. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, again, familiar verse, verses 3 through 8. I mean, don't be selfish. He's writing to Christians here, so evidently the potential is there. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourself. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody that within the first 30 seconds, it always goes right back to them? You got a problem? Oh, yeah, man, I got some problems, too. You want to hear about my problems? Not really, because you don't want to hear about my problems. We talk about anything. They've always got a better story. They've always got something. You've gone somewhere. They've been there and gone somewhere else. There's always, it always go, they're just interested in themselves and making a good impression. You know, one of the most humble things you can do is care more about someone else than you. You know, the old saying is the reason God gave us two ears and one mouth do twice as much listening because that values somebody else. Humbling yourself. Just don't think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who though he was God, did not demand or cling to his rights as God, but laid him aside laid aside his mighty power and glory and taking the disguise of a slave and became like a man. The reason it was a disguise is because he was what, it's what others seen in him. Others seen him as meek. Others seen him as the servant. Others seen him as the suffering one. Others seen him as that. But it wasn't who he really was on the inside. He was still God on the inside. And so it's okay for others to look at our lives and see us in ways that they may be judgmental. But it, we can still be secure in who we are in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, and he humbled himself over further, going as far as actually to die a criminal's death on the cross. The humility that he was willing to do for you and I, not just to die for us, but die as a criminal. The example, the depth that he was willing to go for you and to I. And he said, have this same attitude in us. This is what the scripture says. Have this same attitude on the inside of us that we value other people more than ourselves. 
have the same attitude that we're more interested in other people than just ourselves. I don't know how else to say it in a short amount of time other than just get over yourself. Get over yourself. I don't mean that to be, be, be mean. I don't mean that to... But, but folks, the, the longer you focus on you and your problems, the bigger you and your problems get. But when we start to look at others... We start to value others. We start to invest in others. We start to care about other people. All of a sudden, well, who's going to take care of me? The Lord will take care of you. This is the blessed path of humility that I start to walk. That is like the little boy with his lunch. He went and he gave his lunch all that he had. And when he did, God was glorified. The multitude was satisfied. And he had more left over than he had to start with. That's the blessed road of humility along the way. Or you, we don't care about taking care of, uh, just self-centered taking care of ourselves. But we say, Lord, you take care of me and use me to be a blessing to someone else along the way. Humility. It's the blessed path. Humility. It's a real sense of reality in our lives. Humility is a must in the church. Because the moment we get into pride, God's blessings are taken off of us. The moment we get into pride... God's power is taken from us. But when we trust in the Lord, when we humbly come and say, Lord, I can do nothing except by your grace in my life, it's amazing what God can do in our lives. So this week, this week, ask the Lord. First of all, just be be bold enough to ask the Lord, show me the pride that has deceived me. I, I beg of you, Start with that. Don't start with humility. Start with the deception. Because until you get that infection out of you, you're not going to be the healthy that you need to be. God, show me the pride that has deceived my heart. Show me the arrogance, the trust I have in myself or something else in my life first so that I can repent of the pride and then I can really understand and grow in the humility that, I, that needs to be in my life in serving others. I ask, prayed this week, ask God to show you. And you then repent and go on in what he wants to do through you. Heavenly Father, we thank you.